You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Imagine a world where you're always one step ahead of cyber threats, where your defenses are impenetrable because you see what others don't. Welcome to Team Cymru's Threat Intelligence Solutions. With real-time access to the world's largest threat intelligence data ocean, they enable you to turn the tables on attackers. Transform your security from reactive to proactive through accelerated threat hunting and incident response, made possible through automation. Empower your team with visibility and insights to start defending your organization like never before. Team Cymru, be the hunter, not the hunted. Learn more at team-cumry.com slash cyberwire. That's team-cymru.com slash cyberwire. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down the threats and vulnerabilities, solving some of the hard problems and protecting ourselves in a our rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. So this was actually part of the regular stuff that we do uh, in, in terms of threat research. And we, we ended up stumbling across a, um, a new variant of hijack loader. It's a relatively new, if you will, multi-stage tool uh, that's being used by adversaries for deploying additional payloads, threats, or even, uh, e- even additional tooling, right? That's Liviu Arsene, Director of Threat Research and Reporting at CrowdStrike. The research we're discussing today is titled Hijack Loader Expands Techniques to Improve Defense Evasion. And this is actually a thread that continues to become increasingly popular amongst adversaries because it's modular, it is stealth, and deploys defense evasion techniques. And most importantly, it has actually quite a few, or it has a variety of code injection and memory manipulation capabilities. But mm-hmm. ultimately, to summarize, you know, it's just um, its purpose is to be used by adversaries as a staging platform to bring additional tooling or different malware families to infect compromised systems. Hmm. Well, I mean, let's walk through this together here. I mean, starting from the the beginning, I suppose, how would someone? Uh, find themselves uh, targeted by someone using hijack loader? Well, the delivery method can vary. It can be either a spear phishing email with a tainted document, right? And you just click on it uh, thinking that it's uh, some sort of invoice or whatever. It can be, uh, I don't know, even drive-by downloads. So the infection vector may potentially vary, but it's the payload itself that actually quite, that's actually quite interesting in this, um, in this case. Because when we analyzed it uh, and we compared it to what we previously knew, knew about Hijack Loader or what the industry actually knew about Hijack Loader, we found a couple of interesting things. For example, one of the most interesting techniques used by Hijack, this particular variant, was something that we've affectionately named Interactive Process Hollowing. Uh, and it's essentially a variation of process hollowing where instead of creating a child process in a suspended state, the process is actually running and waiting for input or trigger from a parent process that's actually writing to a pipe. And somehow, just hearing myself say that, I made it sound more complicated <laughs> than it actually is. But let's, uh, <laughs> let's go up a level here, Livio, and, and uh, for, because uh, you, have, you have absolutely uh, lost me. Uh, so uh, c- can we describe exactly what, uh, what we're talking about here? Exactly. So process hollowing, essentially, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is a technique used by malware to inject malicious code into a legitimate process, right? Mm. So essentially what happens is the malware creates a new process similar to one that's already running on the targeted system, except that it creates the process in a suspended state so that it can manipulate the process memory by swapping it or injecting malicious code, right? That malicious code usually comes from a file that's on disk, and you know, after it does this memory manipulation, it then resumes the execution of the process. This is essentially the traditional way how, of how process hollowing works. Now, what happens now 
is that this evasion technique is potentially a little bit different. Think of it as a, uh, as a wolf in sheep clothing kind of analogy, right? Hmm. And the key distinction here between the standard way of doing process hollowing and this implementation is that in this case, the child process is not explicitly created in a suspended state, right? which essentially makes it appear less suspicious because standard process hollowing is a fairly well-documented and traditional, if you will, memory manipulation technique. And in our case, it's just a process that's just waiting for input from a different process or it's waiting for a trigger so that it can start doing what it's supposed to do. Essentially, that's why we're calling it an interactive process hollowing variation because it's not suspended, but one that's actually running and waiting instructions. And uh, I've used an analogy to explain this to some of the folks in, in the team. Yeah, because it, it was it was very interesting at the time when we found it. Think of it this way, right? So imagine a bank robbery, right? A bank robbery scenario. Instead of having a getaway driver waiting, you know, being suspended in front of the bank while burglars are going in trying to rob the bank, the getaway driver is actually dropping them off and driving away, circling the block, waiting for I don't know a radio message, a call, or a trigger from the bank robbers to come pick them up. Mm. All right. So essentially. A car that's dropping off a couple of folks in front of a bank and is driving around the block, acting all normal, is less suspicious than one that's parked in front of a bank, practically in a suspended state, right? Right. So standard process hollowing would be, you know, the getaway car waiting in front of a bank, which can be suspicious, while interactive process hollowing would be car going around into traffic as it normally would, and the getaway driver waiting for a signal from the bank robbers to come pick them up, which is, you know, I, I suspect it's less suspicious from a car behavior perspective. <laughs> So when law enforcement is circling the block, they're not going to see a, a, mafia, a, a mafia staff car parked out front of the bank, basically. They're, they're not going to observe <laughs> it right off the bat, right? Right. So, is, is, I mean, is that, so that's the, the difference here. Essentially, it's drawing less attention to itself and, and differentiating it. for. So when you have tools that are looking for this sort of thing, it makes it harder to detect? Well, yes. But uh, the second thing that we found is that is that although it's using this kind of technique, it also has the ability, or the malware developers have actually daisy chained several other techniques together with process hollowing to improve defense evasion capabilities, right? To make hijack loader more difficult to detect. For instance, uh, we found that they daisy chain process doppelganging and process hollowing together. Well, in in a way, they're kind of similar in the sense that they're both described as process injection and defense evasion techniques, but differ essentially in their approach and complexity, right? So for example, I mentioned earlier that process hollowing may leave some traces on disk, right? Some code may be on disk, especially in terms of you know, where it's stored and how it's being injected. So we can classify that as a file-based technique, if you will, mm. while process doppelganging, which is another memory manipulation technique that's daisy-chained with this one, essentially involves um, manipulating Windows and file system APIs to practically achieve the same memory manipulation objective, but without involving any sort of uh, malicious code being written to disk, right? And this makes file doppelganging more, um, a more complex memory manipulation technique, hmm. uh, but without you know, leaving any traces on disk. So we can call this, if you will, a, a, a fileless technique, if you will. And I can go back to a different bank robbery analogy to explain this one if you want to. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay, uh, let me give it a shot. So, okay, so let's imagine for a second having, having bank robbers going in, right, guns blazing, tipping off the alarm, and trying to empty crap cash registers in under three minutes, right? Or, right. So, or however, however long it takes attackers or responders, sorry, to, to come in. Now, a smash and grab. A smash and grab, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, in this scenario, when you, when you combine these two techniques, memory manipulation techniques, doppelganging and the other one, what happens is we can look at these folks as thieves or burglars going in with a stealth, stealthier approach, right? So mm. one of them goes in, for example, let's do a Hollywood scenario, right? One of them goes in, uh, swipes an ID from a security guard, adds a photo on top of the ID, changes, it, changes into a security guard uniform in the bathroom, and then makes his way to the vault using the legitimate but you know, tainted security ID. And if we are to take this scenario, crazy scenario, even one step further into full Ocean's Eleven, um, <laughs> uh, once the guy reaches the vault, he you know, cracks open a lunchbox that he was carrying as he went through the security. Uh, and instead of a sandwich being in the, in the lunchbox, 
he essentially has lockpicks and safe breaking tools, which would qualify as process hollowing, right? By swapping mm. clean code, aka the sandwich, with malicious code, aka the lockpicks. I may have gone a bit off the rails with the analogy, <laughs> but the no, point I is, <laughs> the point is, uh, by introducing um, you know new techniques or by daisy chaining multiple techniques for um, process injection, memory manipulation, for the purpose of defense evasion, is a way of making the threat, in this case, hijack loader, a lot stealthier. We'll be right back. Hey everybody, want to take a few minutes here and talk about our sponsor, Splunk. You know, you need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. Well, before we dig into the third thing, I, I'm curious, you know, from your position as as a defender, um, what do these changes mean for you all in, in being able to detect these things? Well, uh, it essentially means that if you are a defender, you need to first understand how these threats behave, and you need to have a platform that's able to offer defensive capabilities across multiple layers, right? So for example, uh, you would need um, machine learning capabilities to either statically or dynamically detect malicious behavior. You would need some sort of uh, what we call actually uh, indicators of attack, which are essentially um, real-time indicators of attack, the, of malicious behavior. Hmm. Uh, and you also you would also need um, to augment that platform with intelligence-enriched telemetry, right? And by that, I mean, you also need to have an understanding of the adversary's motivation for building and using tools like these, like loaders or some other, or any other tool, sort, sort of tools, right? By doing this kind of research, we're essentially trying to, and the goal is essentially to add as many, as many hoops for attackers to jump through and make it essentially impossible for them to, to not just come in and rob the bank, but also make it impossible for them to just park in front of the bank, essentially. Right. All right, well, let's move on to the third uh, section you want to talk about here. What's going on? Uh, right. The third section was that, um, or we also found that hijack loaders, or its developers specifically, made some very interesting, uh, or dare I say, uncommon or unnecessary steps that can make the threat a bit noisier. For example, uh, some steps that they've added in the multi-stage uh, you know, behavior of uh, the threat, potentially render some previous steps obsolete or useless. Also, in previous versions, they've had some code injection mechanisms that may not, that may not have worked as intended at the time, but they kind of fixed or patched these things in the new variant. However, for example, they did not completely clean up system calls used to perform threat, manipula uh, threat manipulation, for example. Right. Hmm. Uh, the point is, Hijack Loader uh, shows signs that it continues to evolve as its developers, I would say, experiment and enhance its capabilities, right? Is this, uh, I don't know, you know laziness or, or inattention on the developer's part to, to leave these things behind that are no longer functional? I would call this standard developer practice. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, so think right. of it this way. I, I I'm just imagining uh, many of our listeners vigorously nodding their heads in agreement that this is yeah, uh, I mean, how it works. <laughs> I mean, we've all been there, right? You, right, you, right? you spend an entire day trying to get some code to work, and you're trying out <laughs> different functionalities, different different functions, different different features. At one point, it works, and you just don't want to go back and try to see why it works. If it If it works, don't go back and change it. And that's pretty much what happens. Most of the time with developers. Um, <laughs> not sure if this is the case in, in, in here with Hijack Loader, 
but it could be one potential explanation for why this happened. And yeah. um, and hijack loaders are not uh, necessarily as uncommon as you would think, right? So, and I'm going to make a very interesting segue into our recent uh, 2024 um, uh, CrowdStrike threat report. If, I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at it, but if you if you do, go to the eCrime landscape section, and you will see that the CrowdStrike eCrime index lists, amongst you know a boatload of other things, uh, it lists that the average loader cost on the criminal market actually increased by 169%, if I'm not mistaken, in 2023 hmm. compared to 2022. So this, in context with the fact that loaders, you know, like hijack loaders, seem to go through various upgrades, feature experimentations, or development life cycles, uh, I would dare say that um, it points to the fact that loaders are very popular amongst you know, e-crime community, especially since they can be used to, um, to deploy additional payloads and tooling, you know, like ransomware or information stealers that go uh, after um, sensitive data or uh, identity credentials. Yeah. So what are your recommendations here? I mean, how should folks best go about protecting themselves? So, yeah, this whole, I, I guess it feeds into the whole how do organizations stay sell- safe and protect themselves, right? Not just from loaders, but from, you know, sophisticated threats and adversaries. I would say that it, it, it is very important for organizations to embrace a platform-based approach for protecting you know, critical areas of enterprise risk, right? Like endpoints, cloud workloads, identities, and data, right? And I would also say that a platform or that platform also needs to employ, like I mentioned previously, a layered approach for malware uh, or threat detection using machine learning, uh, real-time indicators of attack. We call them IOAs for identifying malicious behavior, intelligence-enriched telemetry, all essentially built around a single, you know, uh, if you will, lightweight agent architecture, right? So for example, right, let's take hijack loader in this case. CrowdStrike's Falcon, um, CrowdStrike Falcon sensors machine learning capabilities can automatically detect and prevent it during the initial stages of attack. Uh, you know, and I mean by that, as soon as the malware is downloaded onto the victim's machine, bam, machine learning kicks in, it's automatically detected and prevented. Also, our behavior-based detection capabilities, you know, like IOAs, indicators of attack, can recognize malicious behavior, malicious behavior patterns at various stages of the attack, including when you know hijack loader starts employing tactics like process injection attempts and immediately shut it down. So I would, I would say that any organization that wants to stay ahead, not just wants to stay ahead, not just in terms of protecting themselves against loaders or e-crime activity, but also against sophisticated adversary uh, or adversarial trade craft should be or should turn to, to, to platforms like this, unified platforms that can uh, offer visibility across all endpoints, across every infrastructure, and you know, give you the ability to not just identify threats, but also stop them and potentially prevent breaches, uh, breaches from happening. How would you rate the sophistication of the folks behind Hijack Loader? It depends on what we would, what scoring system would we use? Would we use uh, their developing capabilities? Would we would we rate their developing capabilities? Would we rate their um, ingenuity? I would give them on a scale of one to ten for ingenuity. I would give them around a seven potentially because hmm. I, it's a it's an interesting daisy chain techniques, memory manipulation techniques that I've seen. I don't dare rate their developer skills. Um, I suspect I suspect this is still, you know, just like any loader or any piece of malware out there, it's still an ongoing process. And some some developers out there may have branches that are more um, better coded than this one, let's say. Our thanks to Livio Arsene from CrowdStrike for joining us. The research is titled Hijack Loader Expands Techniques to Improve Defense Evasion. We'll have a link in the show notes. The CyberWire Research Saturday podcast is a production of N2K Networks. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. 
This episode was produced by Liz Stokes. Our mixer is Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producers are Jennifer Iben and Brandon Karpf. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next time. We know there's an experience gap in cybersecurity, and companies are often enamored with the idea of building teams of superstars. But focusing on a team of unicorns just feeds the talent gap. Join N2K's Simone Petrella and Intuit's Kim Jones on Wednesday, March 27th for an online discussion about the pivotal role security leaders play in shaping the security workforce landscape and how we can start showing up for the future of our industry. Visit our show notes for details and to register.